Fun fact, D-Day had more beaches than just Omaha. Hello you fine folks, today we're talking about the five different beaches the Allies hit during the opening of the Normandy invasion. While the fun fact I gave isn't really much of a fun fact, it highlights the point that when most people think about D-Day, they only have images of Omaha Beach, whether that's from Saving Private Ryan, famous D-Day pictures, or World War II video games. In honor of the 80th anniversary of D-Day, I wanted to make a video that highlights and explains what happened on each of the five different beaches, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. So join me, and we will remember those beaches beaches and the men that died there. The invasion that hit the coast of Normandy was divided into two task forces. The Western Task Force carried the U.S. First Army under the command of General Omar Bradley and assaulted beaches Utah and Omaha. The Eastern Task Force transported the British Second Army commanded by General Miles Dempsey and was responsible for beaches Gold, Juno, and Sword. We'll work from west to east to keep things simple. Utah and Omaha Beach were the first to see Allied boots, with both being attacked at 6.30 a.m. Furthest to the west, Utah Beach was assaulted by the Seventh Army Corps under the command of Major General Collins. A total of 23,000 troops landed here. The initial landing force ran into some navigational issues here. They lost three of their four control craft to mines, and they were pushed south by a strong current that took them a mile away from their intended landing site. When Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt Jr., son of Teddy Roosevelt, landed and realized the mistake, he exclaimed, We'll start the war from here, and urged the division forward. He was awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions that day, but sadly died of a heart attack just one month later. Despite Despite the troops not landing in their intended zone, Utah Beach was a remarkable success. The new landing site actually turned out to be less well defended, and a successful airborne assault to the southwest prevented the Germans from immediately counterattacking. In addition, this beach was well softened by bombing raids and naval bombardment, and the strong current washed ashore many of the water obstacles. Utah Beach was the least deadly of the five, with the Allies taking around 200 casualties there. To the east of Utah, Omaha Beach was hit by 34,000 troops of the 5th Army Corps under the command of General Garrow. While Utah was the easiest beach to hit, Omaha proved the deadliest, with the Americans taking 2,400 casualties. This was due to a variety of reasons. For one, Omaha was dominated by high cliffs and bluffs, giving the Germans the definitive high ground advantage. Allied planes also hadn't properly bombed the shore, leaving many landing obstacles intact. Combined with a difficult sandbar, this held up many of the landing craft, forcing their troops to wade to shore while under intense machine gun fire. In addition, the support landing force of amphibious tanks was decimated by rough waters, difficult beach terrain, and enemy fire, leaving the hapless troops to fight on their own. On top of all this, the Allies' intelligence report that a single regiment would defend the beachhead proved entirely inaccurate, and the American troops found themselves fighting against an entire infantry division. Omaha Beach is famously depicted in the open opening scene of Saving Private Ryan. And if you're wondering if Spielberg did it justice, so many D-Day veterans were stricken with flashbacks during screenings of the film that the VA had to provide a temporary counseling hotline. Omaha Beach also saw the famous battle of Pointe du Hoc, a sheer cliff face that projected out into the water and provided a commanding artillery position for the Germans to harass the American forces. Members of the 2nd Ranger Battalion were tasked with scaling these cliffs via rope ladders in order to neutralize the position. The Rangers succeeded in capturing the position, and despite being isolated from the rest of the American forces, they held Pointe de Hoc for two days before being relieved on June 8th. Due to differences in tide, the Eastern Task Force hit its beaches later than the Americans, with Golden Sword receiving Allied troops at 720 a.m. and Juno being hit at 7.45. Under the command of Lieutenant General Bucknell, the British 30 Corps was responsible for Gold Beach, the centermost of the D-Day beaches. Gold Beach was the second lightest beach for the Allies' initial assault, with the British receiving around 400 casualties out of 2,500 troops. While the Brits didn't see much resistance on the beach itself, high winds had exaggerated the incoming tide, preventing engineers from removing landing obstacles. As a result, many larger landing craft struck mines while trying to land. The British British naval bombardment helped soften the heavier defenses at Gold Beach, but a few artillery pieces continued to harass British troops throughout the day. In addition, the Germans were barricaded in fortified buildings at the shoreline, and the nearby German 352nd Infantry Division gave fierce resistance to the British thrust. The nearby town of Bayeux, which was meant to be captured on D-Day, held 
out until the following day. The final two beaches were both the responsibility of the British First Corps, under the command of Lieutenant General Crocker. Juneau Beach was the only Canadian beach on D-Day, and was assaulted by 21,400 men of the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division. Similar to Gold Beach, engineers were unable to remove water obstacles in advance of the landing craft, but for a different reason. The waters at Juneau were dominated by coral reefs that necessitated a later tidal stage in order to pass. This is why H hour for Juno was set 20 minutes later than its neighboring British beaches. The landings were delayed another 10 minutes beyond this, making it impossible to remove obstacles in the high water. This meant that the Canadian landing craft had to proceed slowly and deliberately, and nearly a third were damaged or destroyed by mines. Fortunately, the gun emplacements at Juno were not fully developed, and although aerial bombing did little to neutralize them, naval bombardments helped mitigate German artillery support in the area. However, the Germans still possessed strong machine gun positions, and their enfilading fire devastated the initial Canadian assault force. Nevertheless, the Canadians persevered. By the end of the day, despite receiving 1,200 casualties, they had made good progress into the small towns beyond the sand dunes. The easternmost of the D-Day beaches, Sword Beach was the responsibility of the British 3rd Infantry Division, which landed 29,000 troops by the end of the day. This beachhead was relatively lightly fortified, but several artillery placements beyond the dunes had to be dealt with, and British ordnance set to work. Initial resistance was strong, but as British armor made it to shore, troops were able to establish a foothold and suppress enemy fire. Within a few hours, obstructions had been removed, and reinforcements were able to begin streaming in to support the initial assault force. The Troops at Sword fared moderately, taking 630 casualties. However, it's worth noting that here, between Juno and Sword Beach, the Germans were able to make their only legitimate counterattack that day. Elements of the 21st Panzer Division had pushed forward from the important town of Caen, preventing the Allies from uniting Juno and Sword Beach. While the counterattack was dealt with, Caen would hold out and not be fully captured until six weeks later on July 19th. And that concludes our exploration of the five beaches of D-Day. This of course is not a comprehensive look at all that happened on D-Day, and I didn't even scratch the surface of all the events and objectives that were set for June 6th, but I hope this video gives you a better idea of what each beach was like. If you're looking for more D-Day content, check out my D-Day in a Nutshell video, as well as my video explaining the various landing craft used on D-Day. If this video was worth your time, don't forget to like, and do the subscribe so you stay tuned in for all future vids. I'll see you guys in the next video. Ruibas out.